What's up everybody? Welcome back to another bus driver experience clips. If you're new to the channel, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Here, here, here. I edit and I don't even know where this goes. And of course, if you love me, really like this stuff, go ahead and like it before. If not, watch the video all the way through. This one is jam packed full of content. So a few months ago, I talked to Sean Baker. Sean Baker is a carnivore medical doctor. One of the real spokespersons in the space of the carnivore and ketogenic diet, we'll say. Carnivore and keto are different though. Watch the video to find out. Before talking with Sean, I knew about the carnivore diet. I had not practiced or tried it out yet. I did for a week. Yeah, week, didn't make it two weeks. It's really hard to stick to. However, there are crazy amounts of health benefits from eating a carnivore diet. Again, the carnivore diet is not for anybody. I am not a medical professional. Don't listen to me. Should you? In this clip right here, this is Sean briefly explaining what the carnivore diet is and how we kind of went into a plant-based society. This is talking about 8,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, if you are familiar with your history. If you want to listen to the full or watch the full video, that's going to be in the podcast playlist. If you want to just listen to it and you can't watch the whole thing, that's going to be on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, the show is there. And here's Sean Baker. Yeah, so the way I consider uh, a carnivore diet is basically an animal-based diet where we focus on animal-based nutrition and then we either completely eliminate or significantly limit plants in an effort to improve our health and so this is in direct contrast to what we've been doing for you know the last 10,000 years where plants have dominated the diet and the results have been pretty intriguing it's, it's interesting if you look back and see where you know or why we eat the, eat the things we do and eat the way we do and you know, there was a big jump for us as humans from that uh, boom in like 8,000 years ago to say, hey, we don't have to worry about food anymore. And I mean, doing that kind of gave us civilization. It gave us the, the freedom and availability in our lives to make science, politics, religion, culture. Um, you know, it, it had its benefits. And is, is, it, is it at a time where it's like just weighed out now? Is it something that we need to push on towards? Or is it something that is a choice for humans that we have all the freedom to make? Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, we we basically ran out of our food supply. I mean, that's that's what really happened. That's why agriculture then agriculture was born. I mean, we lived in a time for, if we consider human beings have been on the planet about three million years, uh, you know, starting out as you know, arguably Homo habilis, and then progressing through Homo erectus, and then eventually Homo sapiens. Uh, we lived in a, in a in a world where we we had you know, millions and billions of huge megafaunal animals. And that was our primary source of food. As we became more prolific as a species, we ended up basically eating our food supply. And then when that dwindled, when we lost the, the great megafauna about 25, you know, around beginning about 50,000 years ago, and then, and then kind of culminating around 20,000 years ago, uh, we had to look for alternative sources of, of food. And so that's what we did. And so we, we adopted agriculture out of necessity. And as a result of that, humans as a species became uh, smaller, about six inches smaller. Our brain shrunk about 200 cc's. Our dentition became poor. Uh, our bone structure was, was weaker. Our muscle attachments were weaker. Uh, and sure, we were able to support larger numbers of population, you know, by exploiting, uh, you know, grains and other agricultural products. But the ultimate result was uh, just a degradation of the overall health of the population, uh, despite the fact that civilization has flourished and we've been able to do wonderful technological things. We are still, on average, less healthy than we used to be. Interesting. And for real quick, I know. You could define what megafauna is. I know woolly mammoth would be one, but even for me, I, what was some other animals? Yeah, so most people will define a megafauna typically as an animal that I think is in excess of 100 pounds or 100 kilos. I'm not sure. I can't remember the cutoff on that. But if we look at, uh, you know, the beginning of the Pleistocene, which started about 125,000 years ago, and they've done some pretty good research. Felisa Smith out of the University of New Mexico has done this research. And they estimate the average size of a mammal, you know, 125,000 years ago, it was about 500 kilograms. That was the average size. You know, if we take all the animals and kind of line them up and then take their average weight, it would be about 500 kilograms. And if we compare that to today, the average size of an animal is about seven kilograms. And mm -hmm. so we've gone literally two orders of magnitude smaller in the amount of animal material we've had available to us. And that ratio comparable just to having more people? And just less resources and everything kind of shrinking well, well, yeah, I mean, humans preferentially sought out bigger animals just because they were a better source of nutrition. You think about it, if your technology was basically, you know, basically a spear and you had to get food and, you know, you could, you could try to gather, you know, 15 million raspberries, 
or you know you could hunt some small very quickly moving antelope or you had a slow moving animal that has lots of calories that doesn't run away i mean the choice was pretty obvious and humans clearly did that and it's, it's very clearly seen that humans are very proficient at killing you know things like elephants you know when africans hunt them one or two guys can kill an elephant with ease and so homo erectus discovered this about 1.5 million years ago and they did that just continuously and basically until they ran out yeah and even like the the mammoths how much bigger were they a lot of people don't have an idea because they don't exist today but how much bigger they were than even you know an Af african elephant yeah i mean they they would dwarf an african elephant i mean they were they were even much much bigger than that so you would think you know humans usually clustered in in tribes of about or, or groups of about 10 to 20 people and they would take down a, an elephant that weigh or a mammoth that might weigh eighteen thousand pounds and they could eat for three or four months, five months, and they'd have to make one kill, and that was it. And the mammoths were everywhere. So it was very plausible that, you know, that's all they had to do. Mm -hmm. And that's even interesting to today. You know, you're talking about if we were to farm, you know, say 15 million raspberries. But even like, you know, if you would buy a whole cow or a whole pig, you're still probably getting more beneficial nutrients out of like, a whole entire animal than you would be getting out of, you know, plant-based food. Right. I mean, you know, if you think about it, everything that you as an animal needs to function, all the nutrition you need is also found in another animal. I mean, you think about all the nutrition, all the nutrients. There are, you know, only a few things that human beings need that are absolutely essential to our survival that we have to eat. We have to get essential amino acids, essential fats, vitamins and minerals. All of them, every single one of them is contained within an animal. And they're also, not only are they contained in there, they're contained in the ideal ratios. You know, if you think about it, what does it take to build human tissue it's, or animal tissue? It's just more animal tissue. That's the ideal uh, sort of uh, nutritional scheme. So when you go on a plant-based diet, it's, it becomes more challenging. It's very uh, sort of more difficult to, to, to sort of cobble together the nutrition you need to make it work. Plants have a lot of what's called anti-nutrients. Uh, they have a lot of uh, things, they have a lot of uh, nutrients that are not in the correct form that humans need. And so we have to try to convert those and we don't do that necessarily very efficiently. And some people are better at it than others. I think vitamin A was a big one that you can get in animal-based nutri nutrients, but in the uh, other nutrients. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so we can talk a little bit about vitamin A. So vitamin A in the plant-based form is known as beta carotene. So we hear about that, you know, carrots, you eat vitamin A, it'll help your eyes. I hate carrots. Yeah, carrots are not the best. And, and, and interestingly <laughs> though, if we look at wild carrots, what ca carrots would have looked like 30, 40,000 years ago, they were all fiber. I mean, there was very little starch in those. So it would be very unlikely that humans would have selected carrots as a major source of nutrition. How much starch does it have compared to today? And like, where does that starch come from? Is that gen genetically Well, it's, gen it's basically been genetically, you know, we basically selectively bred those. You know, mm -hmm. we find, you know, this is how we do it with plants. We just breed them up and up and up until we get enough generations in where they're producing more. So we select out for the starch producing ones. So, but yeah, the, the beta carotene in, uh, humans is not the form of vitamin a that we actually use we use something called retinol and so there's a conversion that has to occur and the rate of conversion in many people's is very poor some people it's only 10 percent and so you have to eat basically potentially 10 times as much and this is the thing with plant foods you may have to eat higher and higher amounts to get the same amount of nutrition that you would if you if you got an equivalent source of an animal and so it's not that uh the problem is a lot of people make the argument based on calories alone. And, you know, we can feed them. the most calorie uh, efficient way to feed human beings. If we only talk about calories is basically sugar. Sugar is the most calorie efficient crop that we can grow. Now, we all know that we just can't sit there and live on sugar. Mm -mm. Uh, it's got a lot of problems with that. Inflammation will kill you. Yeah, inflammation will get you and a lot of other things. And so <laughs> when we when we really look at nutrition and we look at things that are essential, particularly things like uh, certain amino acids like leucine and others, uh, we can get that so much more readily in an animal-based product, whereas with a plant-based product, you'd have to eat tremendously more amounts of food to do the same thing. Hmm. So, what do you think? Are you ready to eat only red meat? Are you ready to only eat animal products? I've given it a try. It's pretty fascinating, but you won't know until you try it out for yourself. Of course, consult your medical doctor first. I'm not a doctor. I am not giving you guys any health benefits or health tips at the moment. Don't take my word for this when we're dealing with people's health. However, if you're interested and you want to experiment with it, 
You won't know until you try yourself. Thanks again so much for tuning in, guys. Remember, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Go check out the full video with Sean in the podcast playlist. And if you want to listen to the full show, that's going to be on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, whatever. And you know what it is. We'll see you on the bus.